celebrating the birthday of our great nation. And I realize we have problems. We have challenges. We have opportunities. But we enjoy freedoms that are only dreamed about in many parts of the world. You know, they don't have a, some of them don't even have a clue of what we have. I looked up trying to find out, well, you know, how many people are waiting to come into America? And we really don't know. But I found out that for a green card, that's one that you can get after you've had a work visa for a while, that a green card, the shortest wait is for India. And they have to wait 12 years to get in. 12 years. There's over 160 million adults who would love to move to America. By far the number one destination in the world. They would love to come to America. So I tell those that want to leave, we'll help them pack. <laughs> but 160 million that would love to come, and that probably does not include millions who don't even have a clue. You know, there's some places that their news is limited and they don't know what it would be like to live in America. Because if they knew, there'd be even more wanting to come to America. I was thinking, what if the Christians of the world were looked at from that perspective and said, man, I want what they've got. I want it so bad that I'm willing to wait 12, 15 to 20 years to get it. I'm glad as Christians we don't have to do that. But wouldn't it be great if there was such an appeal in the church that people say, well, I want what they have. I want a, people that hunger, waiting in line to see what you have. When I was in high school, one summer I was working at a ranch, and one of my friends wanted to play a cruel trick on me. Now, I know some of you say, with friends like that, you don't need any enemies, and that's true. But it was hot like it's been the last few days, and, and I was building fence, and that's a real cool job anyway. And they decided to put salt in my water. Now, the plan was to put just enough that I wouldn't know it, but just enough to give me thirst. I'm so glad they messed up and put too much it's because I quit drinking. And I kind of think of that as the church, a challenge before us is we have to put just enough out there to cause people to want it, but not so much to drive people off. Now, that's a, that's a fine balance there. That's a challenge. But I remember what Bob Harrington said years ago when he was told, said, well, you know, Bob, I don't want to do something to drive people away from God. And he says, where are you going to drive them to, hell number two? <laughs> Just a thought. Just a thought. It's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. One of my favorite passages in Scripture, and many of you know that, is in 2 Peter chapter 1. And as we read it, I want you to notice the promises. Notice the promises in this chapter. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life. That's a promise. And godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. How many thinks that's a great promise? For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe we could add and make you more appealing to those that do not know God. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all more eager to make your calling and election sure. 
For if you do these things, you will never fall. That's a promise. If you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. How many things? That's a great promise of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, what awesome promises. I particularly like that statement which says, add to your faith. Now, some people misunderstand that. They think that we have to add works to faith in order to be saved. We do not have to add anything to faith to be saved. Faith is all we need. We're saved not of our works, not of our goodness, not of our efforts, but we're saved through faith. But he says, add to your faith. And as we continue on, we see a progression of growth. Life is all about growth. Christianity is all about growth. Here at OAG, we like to call it the journey. The journey. We go through a journey, and we need to enjoy the journey. It's all about the journey. And when we get saved, we realize that God starts us on a journey, and we're ultimately going to go to heaven. I said, as a Christian, we're ultimately going to go into heaven. But until we get there, we've got a journey to go through. And he wants us during that journey to enjoy the journey and to benefit from that journey and calls other people to benefit from it. Wow, what promises we saw. Everything we need, great and precious promises, being made effective. There's a lot of employers out there that like for their employees to be made more effective. Never falling, receiving a rich welcome into the kingdom. Wow. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. I often say that there's nothing in life free. And I believe that to be true. Today, there's an element that says, man, I want everything free. There's no such thing as something free. You say salvation's free. Jesus had to pay dearly for salvation. It costs Jesus It cost Jesus his entire life. It cost him his lifeblood. It cost him suffering. It cost him embarrassment. It cost him pain because of sin. So salvation is not free. And there's nothing in this world free. Somebody has to pay for it. But I'm so glad that God has paid for our salvation. But it wasn't free. It was paid for. Now, our spiritual freedom... Cost God dearly. How many here know that our freedom here in America has cost dearly? Through the years, many wars, many battles, and even times of peace, there are people that died for our freedom. So spiritual freedom cost dearly, and so did our nation's freedom. And we dare not take it lightly. I still feel something when I hear the national anthem. I still feel something in my heart, and I'm so thankful to be a part of America, the beautiful. No wonder people are waiting in line to get here. You say, well, Pastor, we've got tons of problems. Yes, we do. Yeah. But I tell you what, with all those animals on the ark, it probably stunk to high heaven, but I'd rather been on it than off of it. I would rather be in America than any other place in the world today with all of our battles, with all of our challenges, with all of our opportunities. So we need to know that our our freedom did not come free. Ecclesiastes 7.2, the latter part of that verse says, for death is the destiny to every man. The living should take this to heart. Did you know you were born to die? That's your destiny. I know some of you say, well, I want to go to heaven. Yeah, I know. I want to go to heaven too. I don't want to go today. Don't want to go on the next boatload. But if I had to choose to go today or not go, I'd say I'm ready to go. Because that's our destiny. We have to die before we can get there. So our destiny says every person, living soul, should take that to heart. Now, Luke chapter 12 tells an interesting statement. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. How many know that a terrorist can kill your body, but that's it? A terrorist can kill your body. 
A murderer can kill your body, but he can't kill your soul. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of your body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Boy, that seems to be a conflicting statement. Talked about God loves us so much that he knows how many hair you have on your head. For some, that's not a whole lot of a problem. But he knows it. He loves you that much. He cares for you. He cares for you more than the sparrows. He feeds the sparrows. But then he tells you that the reality is you're destined to die. And after that, there's going to be a judgment. And unless we have received Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we're not going to be going into heaven. We're going to be going into hell. He says, don't be afraid of the one that can just kill your body. But be afraid of the one that destines you to hell. Now, I know some people say, well, God doesn't, won't make you go to hell. He's too loving. God never makes anybody to go to hell. He's made a way of escape. He's provided an escape route, and it's up to us to do it. Max Locato made this statement. He says, to understand hell is to pray more earnestly and to serve more diligently. Let me say that again. To understand hell is to pray more earnestly and to serve more diligently. What in the world does he mean? It means if we understand the reality of hell and that everybody's going to be either spending eternity in heaven or hell, that should cause us to pray more earnestly, to work more diligently because it's a great difference. It's a great difference. Listen, George Washington, our first president, made this statement. The establishment of civil and religious liberty was the motive which induced me to the field. He said, the establishment of civil and religious liberty was what caused him to go into the military. He became general of something that wasn't even in existence. Really didn't have much of an army. They gave him responsibility. He said, but what led me into it was not the fact that I wanted to be general." What led me into it was the establishment of civil and religious liberty. So our first president was led into that military because he wanted to serve. He wanted to do what was best to keep and to establish that freedom. You have to remember, this was the first president. This was during the Revolutionary War or prior to the Revolutionary War. He said, I was caused to join the army because I wanted to preserve and to keep the freedom that we were striving to get. He went on to say, the object is obtained and it now remains to be my earnest wish and prayer that the citizens of the United States would make a wise and virtuous use of the blessings placed before them. Let me read that again. He said, it now remains to be my earnest earnest wish and prayer that the citizens of the United States would make a wise and virtuous use of the blessings placed before them. Can I submit to you today that the challenge is just as great and just as real in 2019 as it was in 1783 when George Washington made those words. When George Washington made that statement, it is still true today that the journey as Americans and Christians, we've got a responsibility to do. We've got an opportunity to do. And we, there's tons of causes, many causes that, that we know we can't get into. There's so many causes that you can't get involved in all of them. Some of them are very good, but you can't go there. You have to do those things that you feel God has called you to do. But John Lindell, pastor of James River Assembly of God in Springfield, Missouri, in his outstanding book, The Soul Set Free, shares a simple yet profound statement that that just ministered to me tremendously. And that statement is salvation is a process. I would like to call it, in our terminology of Oxford Assembly, is that salvation is a journey. But this is the statement that he made. I was saved. That's justification. I am being saved. That is sanctification. I will be saved. That is glorification. 
He goes on to say that salvation is the gift of a lifetime. The gift of a lifetime. And he adds this. Everything else that happens in life with God is supposed to come as a natural extension of gratitude to God in response of this free gift. In other words, once we start, start on this journey and we realize all the promises that God has given us, all the blessings God has given us, all the freedoms that God has given us, that they were not given to us just to hold them into our hands. The freedoms of America did not come cheap, neither did the freedoms of Christianity. And those freedoms are not just geared for us to hold on to. They're freedoms that we need to share, expand and to spread. Do you think that might have been what John Kennedy was saying in the 60s when he's speaking to America? He says, ask not what my country can do for me, but what can I do for my country? Now, wouldn't it be an awesome, awesome thing that if Throughout our nation, people would say, I'm not worried about what my country could do for me. But what can I do for my country? Because our mentality today is, I want something. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. And they say that's a generational problem. But I'm going to find, I'm telling you, that I see it among old folks, just among young folks. We want things for nothing. But wouldn't it be great if America would say, I don't know what America can do for me, but what can I do for America? How about Christians? How about churches? We're so thankful what God can do for, I mean, we, we're blessed with gifts. We're blessed with so many things. But wouldn't it be neat for Christians to say, I'm not really wondering, worrying so much about what God can do for me. He's done enough already. How many thinks God's already done enough? But what can I do for God? What can I do for God? Now, I want us to look at that statement. See, forgiveness is letting go of a debt you could not pay. But it was paid for you. That's forgiveness. But in the biblical sense, true forgiveness has not really taken place until we begin a relationship as we start on that journey. And so when we become a Christian, it really renews the opportunity for us to have a relationship with God. And then we begin a journey, an awesome journey. So I want to look at those three little statements that I already made. I was saved. That was justification. You say, Pastor, what does justification mean? Well, Acts chapter 13. Let's look at a couple of verses. Verse 38 through 40. Verse 38. Acts 13. Number 13, verse 38. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything. You could not be justified from by the law of Moses. In other words, the law could not justify, but Jesus did. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. He said you've been justified. Let's go over to Romans chapter 3. First of all, verse 10, where it says, There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one righteous, not even one. And because there was no one righteous, we had to be justified. That term justified, one of the words that people use says, just as if we never sinned. How many knows that all of sin comes short of the glory of God? That's what the next verse we're reading says in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but, and are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, through faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his judgment because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Unpunished sins, couldn't have it. So he had to give forgiveness. He had to give the righteousness or justification. So by faith, we are saved. We have been saved. We were saved. We were saved. Go with me and look at one more. Romans chapter, or excuse me, uh, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, 
deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These are, things are excellent and profitable to everyone. So once we begun the journey, once we say, I, I was saved, I was justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting as I was studying, I run across a person that said they was justified. That person was Rahab. And when you read the scripture, it says Rahab the prostitute was justified. Rahab the prostitute. Yes, why are you making an emphasis on? Because Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab did not say, when I get my life in order, I'm going to believe. She did not say, once I get good enough, I'm going to believe. She believed, and she was justified just because she believed that God of Israel was the God they needed to serve. This was before Jesus. When she hid the spies, she was justified because she had faith. And the reality was, in Jericho, she was the only one that escaped. She was the only one that was saved. She was the only one that's delivered. And it was not because of how good she was. She was a prostitute. It was not because of how rich she was. She probably owned nothing. She was justified because of her faith in a God that she didn't even know. But she said, I heard. We heard how big your God is. And he's a big God. He's a big God. And for those of us that know the graciousness and love and mercy and grace of God, we were saved. We were justified because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. But then we are being saved. Now, I know this sounds kind of, you say, what do you mean you're being saved? We're saved when we believe in Christ. Yes, we are. But we believe in something that we call sanctification. Sanctification is the process that we go through becoming more like Jesus. Romans chapter 12, verses that we all are familiar with. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Wait a minute, spiritual act of worship. That was not for a sacrifice. That was not to earn salvation. It was a form of worship. We need to understand something. Being good is not what's going to get us to heaven. Getting, being saved is what gets us to heaven. And then when we lay our bodies on the altar as a human sacrifice, it's not to give our lives so that we can trade it. It's so we can worship God in spirit and in truth and do the things that God wants us to do. It says we are being uh, Offering our bodies. And then it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Wow, that means as I go on this journey, as I surrender my life to God, and as I try to walk for him day by day, there's a process that I am being transformed. Now, does that mean that you're getting better? Yes. Does that mean that you're going to go to hell if you, if, if you die before it gets finished? It was finished at the cross. In other words, we get saved, but we begin the journey. So I was saved when I became a believer, but now I am being saved by, as I go through life, striving to do what God will have me to do and being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Well, I don't know about you, church, but that kind of gets me excited to know that I can't earn my way to heaven, that I get there through the blood of Jesus Christ, but he will help me to be a better person, to add to my faith. Wow. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, notice what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is being taken away. Now, the Lord is a spirit, 
And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Oh, hallelujah. And we who with unveiled, vase, unveiled vase, faces are reflect, all reflect the Lord's glory and are what being transformed. We should be becoming more like Jesus every day. We're in the process of being transformed. Now, we need to understand this. We need to understand it for those people we minister to and those people that are looking at us, that we're not perfect, that we're not going to be perfect until this life is laid aside, that we're in the process of being transformed to become more like Jesus. But just think about it. Just think about it. If we as a church, when I speak of we as church, I'm talking about the national church, the Christians all over the world. If we really understood this concept, we were saved at the, when we believed, but now we're being saved. We're becoming more like Jesus. And that should be something that people look at and say, I want what he's got. I want what he's got. I'm being transformed. I'm being sanctified. Let's read on. And we who with the unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I was saved, justification. I am being saved, sanctification. I will be saved, glorification. Now I know some of your wives think your husband's already there. And somebody said, you must have the wrong number. <laughs> We're not there yet. But that's our goal. First John chapter 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Wow. See what great love God has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Notice there's an exclamation point. Not a question, but an exclamation point. It even makes another exclamation, and that is what we are. See, if we have been saved, if we are being saved, we are children of God. Beloved, now we're children of God. And so we need to understand that. But because of that, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is it did not know him. Dear friends, now we're the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So I, will, I was saved because I've been justified by faith. I am being saved because I am being sanctified by faith. And I am going to be glorified because one of these days I'm going to put off this old body. Now, some of you might not want to take your old body with you, but I'd be soon lay mine aside. <laughs> to have the glorified body, we'll be like him. We're not there yet, but we will be. Mm. Somebody asked me this morning, I said, Pastor, I thought you was going to dress down today. I said, I'm a little bit later, but there's some things that can't be unseen. You know what I'm talking about. We're in the process of being changed. This morning when I was taking an old shower, a song, taking a shower, an old song came to me. It wasn't an old shower, it was a new shower. <laughs> but I, an old song said, just a little while. Just a little while to stay here. Just a little while. Heaven's gates are standing open. One of these days, one of these days we're going home. One of these days we're going to have a new body. One of these days we're going to be glorified. Is my wife in here? She's probably not. Is she? She, she's next door. See, now she thinks I'm the 13th disciple. Don't tell her any difference. <laughs> Just teasing. We're not there yet. We're on a journey. And the reality is every one of us is somewhere on a journey. 
And you may be here and you're not even started the journey yet. You say, what journey are you talking about? I'm talking about journey to being a child of God. Because, see, you can't get a glorified body until you've been justified. Until you receive the payment for the sins. Because everyone has for all of sin come short of the glory of God. And we couldn't make that payment. We could have spent everything in our checkbook. Regardless of how much it was or how much it is. And it would not have been enough. But Jesus paid it all. He paid it all so that you and I and all of us could be justified. And then he says, I've given you everything you need to live a life that to your faith you can add. You can't add anything to faith to be saved, but you can add to these other things as you are being transformed. As you're growing in Christ. As we're progressing in God. As we continue the journey. And I couldn't help but think as I was thinking about what to share, you know, today. And as God began to give me these thoughts. I couldn't help but think of parallel between our country and our church. Thank God for America. I said, thank God for America. And people are standing in line, literally coming over illegally to get what you and I have. But what if, what if the church would be so excited about God, that we'd be so enthused about God, that we would know all about God, that people would say, I don't know what he has, but I want. I don't know what they have, but I want it. I enjoy life, but I don't simply want to enjoy God's blessings. I want to see others share in this marvelous journey. As an old song says, don't go to heaven alone. Take somebody with you. Most of us are familiar with what we've come to know as Schindler's List. A guy by the name of Schindler, he was in World War II, and he, he was a businessman, and he literally rescued hundreds of Jews to keep them from being killed, gave them jobs and helped them escape. And years later, they gave him an award. They wanted to recognize him for what he had done. And so they made that presentation. And as they made the presentation, they expected him to be overwhelmed with joy. But instead, his reaction was, tears filled his eyes. He said, I could have gotten one more. I could have gotten one more. A challenge is before each of us. I challenge you, if you have not started the journey, don't wait too long. Because there will come a time that you will not be able to start the journey. So don't wait too long. And if you started the journey, I want you to not only enjoy the journey, but to realize that God's given you a purpose. A purpose not only to live for Him, but to serve Him and to fulfill His will for your life. Beloved, today you're a child of God. And one of these days, he'll reward you with a new body, and he'll reward us with eternity. But until then, challenge. America needs you. I said, America needs you. The church needs you to do whatever you can to further the kingdom and to spread freedom. We talk about freedom in America, and as great as it is, it's nothing compared to the freedom that's in Christ. Because there are people today that's in, in prison that are greater freedom than some of us here today. Because he who the Son set free is free indeed. Join me in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. And I pray, the Lord, that you would take this message today and apply it to our hearts. And God, if there's anyone that has not started the journey, 
that they would be justified today. And as they're justified, they will start the sanctification. And one day they will be glorified. So, Father, we ask you to minister by your power, minister by your strength. God, have your way in our hearts and lives today. Minister by your